what is American oil? We're going to talk about that and much more on this episode of The Crude Truth. In 1901, at Spindletop Hill near Beaumont, the future of Texas changed dramatically as, like a fountain of fortune, thousands of barrels of oil burst from the earth towards the sky. Soon, Detroit would be cranking out Model Ts by the millions, and America was on the move, thanks to the black gold being produced in Texas. Now, more than a century later, the vehicles are different, but nothing else has truly changed. Sure, there may be many other alternative energy sources like wind and solar and electric. But let's be honest, America depends on oil and entrepreneurs. And if the USA is truly gonna be independent, it has to know the crude truth. NAEP is a proud sponsor of the crude truth. Be sure to register for the NAEP Expo 2024 February 7th through the 9th at the George R. Brown Convention Center in Houston, Texas. Hurry and register today. Nate, where deals happen. This episode is brought to you by LFS Chemistry, committed to being good stewards of the environment and providing the tools so you can be too. NAEP Expo, where deals happen. Air Compressor Solutions. When everything is on the line, Air Compressor Solutions is the dependable choice to keep commercial business powered up. Sandstone Group. Exec Crew. Elevate your network, elevate your knowledge. Oil and Gas Workers Association. Pecos Country Operating. Fueling our future. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time of day it is. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, watching, or listening to another episode of The Crude Truth. I am just so excited today. Uh, what a day it is. Uh, today is a day. Here we're coming into the new year. We've got new things that we're rocking and rolling. Oil is still here today, and it was here yesterday, and it's going to be here tomorrow. And more importantly, American oil is here. And if I do say so, 2024 is going to be the year that American oil helps save the world when it comes to our oil and gas issues. Today, uh, my guest is somebody that is just world-renowned, somebody that has been in the oil and gas industry uh, for over 30 years, closer to 40 years, somebody that knows the ins and outs. Uh, my guest today is the CEO of Panex, hailing, hailing from Boiling Green, Kentucky, R.J. Burr. R.J., how are you? R.J., I'm doing great. How are you doing today? Oh, my gosh. I, I, I can't complain. I'm uh, trying to get settled in here. Uh, we just got some new offices, so I'm trying to get settled in the best I can. And, right. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> so I can't complain, but thank you so much. You know, uh, when uh, you, um, uh, when I had the opportunity that uh, to, to meet you and, and do this episode, I was just too excited about it. You are a guy that has been in the oil and gas industry, like I said, for almost 30 years and, or well, excuse me, for over 30 years, over closer to 40. And you are just blazing a trail. You've, uh, you've been part of millions of dollars worth of projects. You've produced, you know, millions of barrels of oil and you're in Kentucky, the heart of the country center. Well, Tennessee and Kentucky, right. Are part of the heart of the, the uh, Nashville uh, country scene. Uh, so for all our listeners and viewers out there, please tell us a little about yourself. Well, uh, my name is R.J. Burr. I, I'm from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Now, Nashville, they, they get the country music, but we get to be home of the Corvette. Uh, so, some people can be the peach capital of the world, but uh, every every Corvette riding in America was put together right here in Bowling Green. And yeah. so that's uh, that's kind of something to hang your hat on. Or, you know, or you could say Fruit of the Loom also. We're the headquarters, we have the headquarters of Fruit of the Loom, but Corvette seems a little sexier. Um, now, it's kind of – when you look at being in Kentucky, we, we were talking earlier about uh, – my family came to Kentucky and roughly it was 1989, 1990. The, there was a well hit out in Clinton County, Kentucky, uh, the Ferguson well. And from 4,000 feet deep, this well was producing 4,000 barrels of oil a day. Yeah. And uh, heck, we came out here looking for it. And uh, being oil and gas, uh, we got a rude awakening when we got to Kentucky. Uh, our first five years, we didn't find enough oil to change in your car. And uh, well, well you, you, eventually, you, you yell Capro. Now, the problem we had is we loved the town of Bowling Green. It, it's just, it's, a, it's, it's, I couldn't, uh, I remember my first day here. So I, my formative years were from California. And, and so, so sixth grade to sophomore year and in California, you know, I'm not speaking ill of California. However, when you drive down the road and somebody waved to you that was walking, your first reaction was to grab your wallet. You know, what do you want from me? And, and so 
me and my dad pull in. My mom and sisters were, were in Louisiana with my grandfather. And so me and my dad pull in the big U-Haul. We're unloading. We're doing all this stuff. And I get in the car. I said, Dad, I'm going to go figure out this town. Now, I just turned 16 a month or so before. And okay. uh, so I kind of got I kind of got grandfathered all the kids of Kentucky when they turned 16. They had to wait like six months or 12 months before they could drive. Whoa. And, and so in California, I remember I got my license the day I turned 16. And my mom turned me loose on I-10 driving home. <laughs> and yeah, the, 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 the hindsight being 2020, I can't say I'd, I'd do the same with my kids. Yeah. But uh, so we get here and I pull out and literally no further than a block and a half from the house, I see this mom walking her kid in a stroller mm-hmm. and she waved to me. And my first reaction, I grabbed my wallet. She's like, hang on, what'd she want? Yeah. And as I'm going by, I kind of wave back. Well, turn the corner, go another block, see another woman pushing her kid on a stroller and she waved too. And, and that was the moment I realized, hey, you dummy, they don't want anything from you. They're just saying hi. Yeah. And it was the it it, it was home. And, and so we, at that point, we determined we we'd never pick up stakes again and go anywhere else. We'd stay right here. However, if you're going to hunt for elephants, you go to Africa. Yeah. And uh, if you're going to hunt for oil and gas, you go to the Gulf Coast. You go to where where we know what we're doing. Yeah. And so we stopped drilling in Kentucky, opened up in the, the Gulf Coast, and haven't looked back. Yeah, and what parts of the Gulf Coast are y'all uh, producing from right now? Oh, we've been we've been all over. Um, when it comes to my family story, when, when we got involved in oil, when I got involved, first time my dad brought me on a rig, I was seven. Mm-hmm. And, and so we, we've been around it our whole life. Now, I'm third generation. My mom's family, my mom's dad and her brothers were in the service side of the oil industry. My dad, uh, my dad and mom got married very young, and my dad got into the insurance business oh, 20, 21 years old. And mm-hmm. he sold insurance for oh, roughly six, seven years. Great salesman. I mean, he, that's just it. it, it God, I believe God gives everybody at least one talent. It's your job to find it. And uh, some people get more, some people get a handful. Well, my, my dad was given the ability to sell. Yeah. And, and so, all of a sudden he starts doing the math on it. And he's like, Whoa, it's going to take me 30 years to make the kind of money that I want to make selling insurance. Cause you know, once you build it up, it's awesome. However, to build it up takes you a while to get it going. Well, at that time he's 27 years old and my uncle Gene's living in Dallas and he calls my dad and says, Bob, I think I got a game. And dad's like, all right, what is it? He said, come to Dallas. Let me show you what we're doing. Yeah. And they were funding an oil deal. Mm-hmm. And my dad sat there. Oh, this is Wild West, 1973. Oh. And so my my dad sat there and listened to him for about half the morning. Yeah. And looked at Gene and said, "Hey, give me some of those leads." And he grabbed it, made a sale his first day on the phone. <laughs> called my mom, said, "Put the house for sale." And that was his introduction to oil and gas. Oh wow! And I was born two years later. Okay. And so it, now. Every oil and gas company, this, there's nothing academic where you can find this. This is just kind of a old a observation and, and kind of how we classify things in oil. Because every oil and gas company, well, the first thing you need to, we need to state is who is the true American oil and gas industry. Yes. That, that's, that's the first thing that people really need to understand, especially if you're looking at putting your money into oil and gas. You need to understand the playing field you're on. Because oil and gas tax benefits are second to none. You know, how, how many other investments out there can you put a dollar out and Uncle Sam look at you and say, eh, I'll pay 30, 35 cents of that dollar for you. Yep. You know, if, if we don't produce one dime for our partners in year one, they've still made 30, 35% of the money just through the tax benefits. Yep. And, and so the, the, the motivation to invest in oil is tremendous. However, you've got to know what you're getting involved in. When, when you look at American oil, it's not your majors. In fact, your majors, just because they're based here in America, they're international companies. Mm-hmm. They're, they're beholden to their stock. I don't, I don't begrudge them anything. I mean, these guys are doing what they have to do. However, 83% of the oil, 90% of the gas, and more than 90% of the wells drilled domestically are drilled by roughly 9,000 independent companies that average 12 employees or less. That's your oil industry. Now, the reason I say that, most of these companies, in fact, I'd be willing to bet all of them, they start out the same way, doing what we call chasing oil. So you have a guy, he wants to be an oil man. He finds a prospect, raises some money, goes out and drills the well. For 99.9% of the people, that's it. They miss the well, 
can't raise any more money, out of business, goes in the front door. Well, the very fortunate few that hit that well, they found job security. Their job is secure as long as they have wells to drill around that original well and develop the field. Well, all while they're developing it, they're looking for another lily pad where they can jump to it. Yeah. A successful old man looks up. He's 60, 70, 80 years old. He's found five, 10, maybe 15 of these lily pads. His partners have made a tremendous amount of money. He's made a tremendous amount of money. However, he spent his entire career chasing oil. And what we mean by that doesn't mean that he's not good at what he does. It means that he had to produce everything he found to keep the engine going. Yeah. Now, the rarest occurrence in oil is when you jump from that chasing oil category into what we call the producing oil category. Now, there's really only two differences. The first, when you're in the producing oil category, every time you drill, you know the oil's there. Doesn't mean you're going to hit it. This is still oil and gas. Anything can happen when that drill bit touches the ground. Yeah. However, you know you're on top of oil. But more importantly, the second difference is when you're in the producing oil stage, you have enough reserves to utilize those reserves to acquire more reserves. Now you're in the oil business. Mm -hmm. You know, pr prime example. We have a field right now where we're really not interested in anything deeper than eight, 9,000 feet. Yeah. We can do it. I, heck, I've drilled 20,000 foot well. I'm, I'm not sweating that. However, it doesn't, we're not interested. They're, they're more difficult. There's really, I'm not saying we won't, but we just, we're not interested in it. Well, just because we're not interested in what's below 10,000, 8, 9,000, 10,000 feet doesn't mean that the oil's not there. Yeah. We have potentially 30 million barrels sitting below us from 10 to 15,000 feet. Well, we have partners out there that love deep wells. We have industry partners. Yeah. They don't like anything shallower than 10,000 feet. We come to them and say, look, here's what we have. Let us see what you have. You come drill ours. We'll keep a piece. We'll come drill yours. You keep a piece. Now, we've utilized those reserves to acquire more reserves. Yeah. Now, for a company to do, for somebody to do that once it is pretty impressive. My family's now done it twice. Yeah. The, the first time we did it, we really, we jokingly, we call it our first life in oil. That ended about 10 years ago when Marathon Oil bought my family's company. Okay. Because once you get to that producing oil stage, typically one of three things happens. One, you're making so much money. Your partner's making so much money. You just keep it as is and keep rolling. Two, you take it public. Three, a major comes in and buys you. Well, a major, they came in and bought us. Yep. And that was, oh, what, 10, 11 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. And uh, we entered into early retirement. I was in my mid-30s, uh, thought I was going to play on the PGA Tour. It took, took me about six months to realize that that wasn't going to happen. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but seven years ago, this past July, uh, I was sitting out there, and I remember it was on 18, and I snap hooked one in the water. I didn't even, go, didn't even go to the water. I just threw the driver in my bag, got in the car, drove to my truck, drove to my dad's house, and my brother happened to be there. Yeah. I said, guys, I'm going batshit crazy. It's time to get back to work. <laughs> and uh, thank God they were thinking the same thing. And that was <laughs> when Pan X was formed. That, that was when we started. And that, that's basically – for the last seven years. Now there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the last seven years and we've been very fortunate, but uh, I'll just put it to you this way. We saw the crash coming. Now, if anybody ever tells you they saw Corona coming, they're lying, they're lying to you. We didn't, you know, nobody saw that coming. What we saw was Russia and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. You know, wh whether you like Trump or not, that's irrelevant to the discussion. What he did was he basically took OPEC's power and took it from him. Yeah. And the oil, oil, OPEC has been the heart of oil and gas prices for 60 something years. And all of a sudden, when our shale industry was producing like they were producing, OPEC wasn't as relevant. Well, that's what we saw. We saw Russia and Saudi Arabia, OPEC, OPEC plus, increasing production, yeah. pushing that price down, and essentially an economic war against uh, the U.S. shale industry. Exactly. Yes. Now, what, what really got us where we knew there was something was going to happen is when you know the industry, those shale companies are highly leveraged. Most of them need at least $50 a barrel to pay their bills. Anything above 50 is where they make their profit. And so what we saw is we saw Russia and Saudi Arabia pushing it to 40, $45 a barrel. 
and putting a lot of those companies in trouble. And so we knew there would be some opportunities to pick up reserves. Now, the other side of that dirty little secret is Russia and Saudi Arabia need $50 a barrel also. Mm -hmm. But we were betting that they were willing that they could last longer than the shale industry. And so that was really what we started started looking for. We started anticipating happening. We thought it'd take 18 to 24 months to happen. And when you look at crashes, when you look at all the economic chaos over our country's history, in every case, there's a group of people that come out of the other side looking like geniuses. Mm -hmm. And, And when you string their stories together, there's really only two common factors that they share. One, when their crash happened, they had cash in hand. Yeah. Two, when the opportunity presented itself, they had, uh, as my dad would say, the intestinal fortitude to push their chips in the middle of the table. Yeah. And, and so that, that's really what we were building all this on. We got our ha- cash handy. We were ready to go. And then all of a sudden, April 20th, 2020 happens. Yeah. And, and Corona, while it wasn't the trigger we envisioned, the result was the exact same. The only difference, it took what we thought would take 18 to 24 months to play out and crunched it down into 30 days. Yep. And and what happened, the initial wave, and that's where knowing the American oil industry helps explain a lot of this. When that happened, don't get me wrong, it hurt the majors. It hurt your bigger companies, but they are those bigger companies. It didn't hurt them where it shut them down. Yeah. When you look at the independent producers in America, those 9,000 companies, that average 12 employees or less, that's who it gutted. And and your first wave immediately, when prices dropped, your first wave were the companies that were either brand new, not financially solvent, or on shaky ground to begin with. Immediately, boom, they were wiped out, out of business. Yes, they were gone. Well, then a couple of months later, remember when we sent everybody home for COVID? Yep. Your larger companies that could pay their employees enough to get them to come back to the field, more than the government, they made it. Yep. The companies that couldn't get their employees back out there, they didn't. And, and so that was your next wave. And, and so what we saw is we saw a clearing of the playing field unlike we've ever seen. Yeah. And, and there were acquisition opportunities that really, I've been doing this my whole life. I've never seen the kind of acquisition opportunities you see right now. Oh, they're, they're, they're ridiculous, RJ. I know for us, you know, one thing, you know, like I was sharing, you know, I'm second generation. My dad's been in it since the mid eighties himself. And it was always fun to, you know, he's always said, I've seen this before. Uh, we got this. I've seen this. And so I, and, and, and my listeners have heard me say this before that, you know, on April 20th, you know, I called my dad up and go, do you ever seen this? He goes, no. And of course that's the day oil went negative, you know? Yeah. And they're like, no, nope, never seen this one. So can but, you describe, so can you describe exactly where you were at the moment you saw it at negative 40? Oh, I was I was actually at home uh, right before lunch, walking in my bathroom uh, from my bedroom, and I saw the negative price on the phone there about 11, 11, 30. And it was at like negative 13 or 15 at the time. Yeah. And uh, I, I reached out to my dad and a buddy of mine going, what is this about? And, um, and and what a lot of people don't know is like, granted, you know, at that time, oil was at about $25 a barrel, you know, the day before. And give or take. Um, but, you know, we were still getting paid from the last 30 and 60 days. And we continued that for the next two, you know, two to three months there. And, uh, but like you mentioned, you know, we were able to pick up, you know, half a dozen leases during that time frame because we had the cash on hand and people were like, we're done, we're out. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, all right. It's like, well, we've got it. Let's go do it. And we need to buy that production. And and as you're seeing all the mergers and acquisitions out, it's like, let's get that inventory so we can just add to the inventory that we have. Yeah. Well, because the, the key to all of this, oil is not going anywhere. Yeah. Doesn't matter what they say. No. Do, doesn't matter. Look at the actions. Look at the ram. Just, I mean, if, if I'm not a rocket scientist, but if I can sit down and research and look at the numbers and do one plus one will always equal two. Yeah. It'll never equal one and a half, never equal three. It'll always equal two. And so just sit down and put a pencil to it. And mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense. You know, you look at the, to make the conversions that they want to make, you'd have to rape mother earth. Like we've never raped it before. Yep. We'd have to pillage this place. And, and, and so you, you look at it and you say, hang on, are your, 
believes genuine. Because if you truly wanted to help the environment, you'd go nuclear natural gas. Yep. We already have most of the infrastructure for natural gas. Every car could be converted to run on natural gas. You could pipe it to everybody's home in their garage. They could fill it up at night. You wouldn't have to go to convenience stores anymore. Well, why wouldn't you do that? It burns clean. Oh, you want a clean environment? Well, then let's go nuclear. You mean to tell me we can run our most advanced submarines on little suitcase kind of sites? Hmm. Yep. Yet we can't. No. And, and so it's just, it's disingenuous. And, and so when you look at that, and then you look at the role that oil has played, the modern world began when oil was first produced in America. Yep. I mean, the American oil built the world as we know it. Yeah. Now, as your majors dispersed and started going overseas looking for larger reserves, that was when the emphasis was taken away from American oil. But up until that point, I mean, American oil built the modern world. Oh, and if you if you know what you're looking for, that's the that's the key. It's not just randomly going out and grabbing properties. I mean, yeah. if you go grab a piece of property that's been drilled on and stepped on 27 different times and they've got all. Well, you just basically bought a useless tire, yeah. and, you know, so you have to know what like we love salt dumps. Okay. We, we love salt dumps. The reason being, there, there's two reasons. One, most companies don't have the intestinal fortitude to drill on salt dumps. It's difficult drilling. And, and you have to have an expertise to do it. And so that eliminates a lot of the competition. Well, secondly, your salt domes were your original oil fields. Back in the, in the pioneer days of oil, those were the first structures your geologists were able to identify. Yeah. Well, your old oil companies are about like spoiled kids. And a spoiled kid, what's his favorite toy? His next toy. Yep. And so they would go out, they'd drill a well, they'd hit it, they'd cut back flips, they'd drill a handful of wells around it. They'd have, say, 10, 15 wells around this well over a five-year period. Then all of a sudden, they'd hit a well three miles away. Yep. Well, they thought they produced all this, so they'd just pick up and go. Now, yep. don't get me wrong. A lot of the salt domes have been completely developed. There's nothing. No, there's no reason to go in there anymore. Yeah. However, there's a lot of them that weren't properly developed. Oh yeah. Like, uh, I mean, you you look at the we're we're on the the Choctaw right now. Okay. We're on the Bayou Choctaw in, in Baton Rouge. Yes. And when we originally purchased it, we I think we made twenty three acquisitions over the last three three years, and and this one right here was the biggest one because when we originally purchased it and sat down and looked through all the geology, we said, okay, there's probably 10, 15 million barrels still recoverable here. Well, then we went out. And we were the first group to collect the roughly 40,000 different data sets that were created on this field over the last 100 years, originally discovered in uh, 1926. Yeah. And so we went and got every bit of well data on it, digitized it, and put it in one spot. And once we looked at that, we said, holy, there might be 30, 40 million barrels, maybe 50 million barrels sitting out here to develop. Well, then we got the 3D seismic, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That's our salt dome. Yep. They shot the 3D seismic over to see where the salt ended so they could dig their caverns. We just kind of got in touch with them and said, hey, can we see it? We need to know where the salt ends so we don't drill into it. Yeah. Well, once we took that data and laid it on top, well, when you're developing a salt, though, the low-hanging fruit is the overhang. Mm -hmm. Basically, salt dome comes up, creates right. a mushroom yeah. goes like under that, the yeah. mushroom cap. Yeah. Well, that's the low-hanging fruit. That's the first area you develop. We assumed the entire overhang was developed on this when we purchased it. When we laid that 3D seismic over top of it, there was close to 80% of the overhang that wasn't even touched. Wow. There, there could be more than 100 million barrels sitting in this field. And, and so that, that's what we've been doing. We've been developing. We, we've, yeah. drilled, oh, we've drilled 11 wells in the last uh, two years. Okay. And we placed eight of those wells online. And the no. three wells we didn't place online were mechanical failures, but we saw oil on them. So we'll yeah. go back and redrill the well. Yeah. And so it's just, uh, I, I told my, my brother, because my dad, we, my dad retired, oh, it was a year ago right now. Yeah. And uh, my brother and I bought him out and we're sitting here and we're kind of cussing, discussing what we're going to do moving forward. You know, what, what are our strategies? And, and I said, well, I said, Bo, right now, we know that we have more than 200 wells to drill around this salt dome. Yeah. We know it's going to cost us two, 300 million to do the whole thing. If we're right, there's going to be seven, eight billion dollars worth of oil here. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. I said, so we're going to do that anyway. 
there, there's plenty of wells where there's going to be wells for our kids to drill when we're long gone. There's yeah. plenty of oil for our kids to utilize when we're long gone. And, and so we don't have to do a thing. We can stay on the same path and just keep cookie cutting this along. I said, but we're already going to do that. Why don't we shoot for the stars? Yeah. Let, let's see if we can build an Exxon. There, there hasn't been a major American oil company built on American oil in close to 40 years. It, it's happened one time when two companies merged, but they did. They, it wasn't independent. They founded it themselves. And, and so you sit down and you look at the American oil industry. Somebody's going to consolidate this oil. Yeah. It, it, it's too big a piece of pie for what we're doing moving forward. So somebody's going to come in and do it. Mm-hmm. Well, if somebody's going to do it, doesn't it make sense for, for it to be people who actually care what happens to it? You know, that's funny you mentioned consolidating uh, because that's something me and my brother talked about uh, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of similarities here. And I'm glad uh, that we can talk here because, like, uh, my brother's out in the field today. My dad's in his office right now running the books. How old was your dad when he retired real quick? 77. 70. Okay, my dad's 71. And he's still, you know – People think, you know, and, and oh uh, no, he he still comes in, he still comes in two three times a week, yeah. So. Oh yeah, no no no, he's <laughs> always going to have an office, and and you know, and I, I, if if he can go, you know, I joke with him. I said, give me the seventy five, and uh, and then and then we'll see what you can do, uh, you know, if he wants to retire then. But no, he he gets the final say on it. But um, but no, so me and my brother were driving from leases to leases up here in North Texas a couple of weeks ago, and we started out. Uh, by buying some of this old existing production uh, with room for new drills, rework old wells, and then drill some new wells. And, and it's really worked out for us and our family. But we were sitting there, and and I hope I'm not giving away a great trade secret or, or an idea in my head. Um, but it's like you've got all these small oil and gas companies. Like you said, there's 9,000. And you've got oil and gas companies. I had a, a professor at a, a TCU ask me to talk about all of them that are making anywhere between 100 to 500 barrels of oil a day. And they've got maybe five people on the payroll. Mm-hmm. That's a hell of a paycheck. you know. And, and they probably do a lot of the operating work themselves. And so that just makes their paychecks even bigger. But then what about all the other smaller stuff that may be producing 10 barrels a day on these leases, right? These smaller leases. And it's like get a company out there like the real estate did about 10 years ago, where all of a sudden they're just going to start buying up everything. And like their goal is 10% a year. It's like, let's get all this stuff consolidated and let's just make sure we're making 10% a year. And uh, so that that was that's where my idea went with consolidation. So I like your idea; it's a lot a lot bigger than mine. And uh, because well, I mean, we have not had any real American large majors, and again, yes, we can talk about Exxon and all them being American majors, but being built with American oil every day. I mean, the best thing Exxon's done is, as we all know, was the um, merger with Pioneer. Uh, as far as being American oil, I mean, that's pro- I think that's now their largest American asset, if I'm correct. I believe so. I believe yeah. so. Well, but it, it's just something that your majors that are majors now, they made their status yes. when it was the Wild West of oil. Yeah. Now, nowadays, when you act as, as short as three, four years ago, the only way to become a major is to have the reserves, yep. to have the bookable reserves. Well, the only way to find those reserves are to one, find it yourself. Yeah. Well, all the spindle tops are found. Yeah. The the odds of you finding a the build your company overnight field are slim and none. They might do it down the road. Somebody might find some new area, but right now they're they're not there. So that that's very difficult to do doing a small field at a time. Or you buy it from somebody who's already found it. Yep. Up until three years ago. They knew what they had. And so they were going to charge you an arm and a leg for it. And so that route was difficult also. So the the playing field was such that it was next to impossible for somebody to really come up through the ranks and build to that status because you couldn't acquire the reserves fast enough. Right. Now you can. And and that's really what changed. And and so, well, prime example, when the crash happened, we had two partnerships that had been in production for one of them for three months, the other one for two months. 
And that, in those three month and two month period, those two partnerships paid the partners back almost 70% of their money. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, these, these wells were just, they were, they were rocking. They were doing exactly like we had predicted. I mean, we were tickled pink. And then all of a sudden, April 20th happened. Yeah. And it gutted it. I mean, well, it gutted those partnerships because in those wells, the initial flow rate, which was about the first 12 months of production, was where 90% of their money would come from. Yep. And so all of a sudden, when those price, price, prices crashed right in the middle of it, it, it really hurt the partnerships. And, and so at that point in time, if anybody on the, because heck, I knew it was about to happen. Before that, before that price crash, we're about to raise $50 million. Yeah. You know, when you, when you have partnerships that are rocking like that, your partners keep, I mean, it's just, it's infectious. It, it happens. Yeah. And we were about to do it. I, I've done it before. Well, then all of a sudden it crashed. And so if anybody had the, the right to curl up in the fetal position and suck their thumb at that point, it was us. However, once that did happen, we kind of had this uh, little group powwow and we said, hey, guys, this is what we were expecting to happen anyway. Yeah. And so when everybody else pulled their sails in to ride out the storm, we opened ours wide open and started looking to make acquisitions. That, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and now, I mean, we got guys coming to our sites daily trying to sell us their stuff. Yeah. You know, now we're, we're very selective because we don't have to do it. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, I, I told, you remember when the silver crunch happened here two years ago? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, my partners, and I, I'm willing to bet most partners, they live out of three piles of money. I call them three S's. The first pile of money, that's your safe money. Mm-hmm. Or that, excuse me, your first pile, that's your sacred money. That's the money you pay your bills with, pay your family, health care. That's, that, nobody touches that money. Well, the second pile is your safe money. That's where you invest in your gold, in your silver, in your real estate. That You want it to grow, but that's really not the main goal. The, the main goal is when you go back to it, you want as much, hopefully more to be there. Mm-hmm. Well, the third pile is your speculation pile. That's the pile they play with me on. Well, all of a sudden, when that silver crunch happened, I had a partner who had several million in silver. And he called me, he said, Jay, there's more paper silver than there actually is silver. He said, this is just as manipulated as everything else. And so all of a sudden, his safe pile wasn't as safe as he thought it was. And, and so it got my wheels turning and, and it finally dawned on me. If you're tired of the rat race, because nobody can predict what's going to happen in the markets right now. No, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's dyslexic sometimes. I mean, it's, it does what it's not supposed to do. And, and so if you're tired of that rat race and you want to pull your money out of there and park it somewhere, well, what can you back it in where you know there's going to be a demand and you know there's going to be a fair price? Well, it's oil. oil. Now, if you don't know what's there, it's a complete, completely different conversation. If you don't know what you're producing, if you don't know what you have in the ground, that's a completely different subject. However, when you know it's there, well, oil. Because one, half the population wants it free. Mm -hmm. The other half the population wants it a million dollars a barrel. So you have two equally opposing forces pulling on every barrel. You're going to get a fair price. Well, then secondly, we discussed it earlier. Oil's not going anywhere. 80% of the world is just now beginning to use oil. Do you think demand's going to go down? No. And so that's what I tell my partner. I said, look, when you invest in one of our drilling programs, yes, worst case scenario, we could miss the wells. We could miss the yeah. wells. I'm not, I'm not going to deny that. However, with the, with the success we've been, I don't see that as happening. Yeah. Really, what you're speculating on is how many barrels of reserves will your $1 buy? Yeah. We got to drill the wells to find out. You know, and, and if you can get your money out of the rat race, put it in a drilling program, have that program produce oil for you for the next 15 to heck, we got, I got several wells that'll produce for the next 30, 35 years. Yep. One of, one of them has close to 340 feet of pay through 11 different pay sands. Wow. You know, and, and so we, we just hit one last week, have one pay sand that's over 120 feet thick. Whoa. And, and so, you know, it's just, we're, we're, you, you don't want to toot your own horn, but, uh, Look, I, I look at when I stopped playing ball, I had to figure out a way to keep score. Yep. And how you keep score is by how much money you make your partners. Yep. And, and so the more people I can get involved in this, the more people I can make money for, the more people they're going to tell about me, the more people they're going to tell about me. All of a sudden, we're raising that two, three hundred million 
and it's straight from our own circle and you don't have to look to anybody else to, to and do that's it. yeah and that's been the blessing that we've done you know it's like it's all out of our back pocket every now and then we'll bring in a few investors and then you you, you know the goal is to do so well that's like hey let's go do it again um yeah. you know rj you are a freaking wealth of knowledge here and uh you know we're running running low on time um and can you give us a, a quick uh, update on what Panex is doing and what y'all are up to? It sounds like, you know, you really gave a lot of detail in, in a lot of the stuff that y'all are doing, but if you've got just a little bit and, and how people can reach out to you, that would be great. Oh, absolutely. Uh, our, our website, the easiest way is panex.us slash learn. We put that page to get together specifically for individuals who had never invested in oil. Yeah, It gives you a ground foundation of one gas 101 is what we call it. And just kind of shows you the tax benefits, what we look for, gives you an introduction to who we are. Yeah. Anytime somebody decides to put their money with you, it's based on three factors being positive. The first is they have the money. I can't handle that. That's, that's their responsibility. Yeah. The remaining two, who are we? Jay Burr, Panex, my yeah. family, Bo Burr, Bob Burr. Why are we the kind of people you want to do business with? Now, it, once you see that we're the kind of people you want to do business with, then what can we do for you financially? Of the millions of places in this world you can put your money, why is what we're doing one of them? Now, that's what panx.us slash learn was created for, to yeah. show you who we are. Well, when you're done with that page, you'll know whether you want me to show you what we can do for you financially. Now, when it comes to our programs, we drill wells. Right now, we're developing field. I, I got a program, my, my year-end special, and we put something together every year at Christmas time for, for a great program. Right now, I'm drilling two direct offsets. One of them is directly offsetting a well that had 11 pay sands and over 300 feet of pay. The other one's directing a well that uh, offsetting a well that had a one pay sand with 120 feet of pay and potentially another five pay sands below. Yeah. And, and so, you know, uh, our partnerships, uh, since we've been drilling in the Choctaw, I'd say my partners are averaging anywhere from 20 to 40 percent annually. Yeah. Those partnerships, when it's all said and done, they'll produce for 15, 20 couple of them produced for 30, 35 years. Those yep. partners will make. Oh, projecting out now, I'd still, I'd still have to produce it, depend on oil prices. There's a bunch, you know, how, you know, there's a bunch of variables. I, do, yes, so I, yes. I don't want to box myself, but uh, I would say on average, those partnerships will make the partners anywhere from three to six to one on their money Jeez. over the next 15, 20 years. I have one partnership that uh, now these guys, they're sitting on a gold mine. They, they're, they have a piece of every well we drill out there. And if we're... 50% successful in producing what we think is out there. Those partners will make about 20 to one on the money. Yeah. And so, no, we're, we're doing well. You know, now that's not to say everything we do is going to be golden. We oh, yeah. missed wells. This, this is oil and gas. And so I don't want to paint too rosy a picture. I, I've learned that uh, the easiest way to do this is just to be directly upfront about it. I, I'm not, if it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. Uh, if we miss a well, I'm going to tell you, we missed it. If we can do something to help the partnership, we ought to our partners to help them. You know, it, it's our partners and that's not to get you to do anything else. That's not to, that's just strictly because we believe it's the right thing to do. And, and I live my life by, by one real, every night when I go to bed, I walk in the bathroom and I look myself in the mirror. I've been doing it since I was 18 years old. And I ask myself, am I happy with who I'm looking at? And if the answer to that question is no, then you better figure out what you're doing wrong to cause that answer to be no and fix it. And, uh, Knowing that I take care of my partners is one of the easiest ways I know I can look in that mirror, even if it costs us money. Yeah. Without our partners, we don't have a business. Yep. And so every everything we do is geared with one goal. How do we make you money? Now, my email is rjburr at panx.us. Mm -hmm. Easiest way to reach me. Heck, just send me. I, doesn't matter. Uh, if the little hair on your pinky toe has a question, ask it. That's what I'm here for. Okay. You know, now. Don't give you any guarantees, save one. You ask me a question I don't know the answer to, I'll find it for you. Yeah. I Other like than that, it. I come early. I come early, I stay late, and uh, we put our head down, our tail up, and we plow, and uh, corn starts growing. There you go. There you go. I love it. Well, RJ, again, I cannot thank you enough for coming on this episode and really kind of giving us, uh, you know, and, and telling us and sharing the crude truth about what it is about being, you know, an American oil company and and taking care of your partners and and, and how important that truly is. Uh, I wish you nothing but success. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and to all my listeners out there, you know, thank you all very much. And we'll see you again on another episode of The Crude Truth. Again, thank you to our sponsors, LFS Chemistry, NAPE Expo, 
Air Compressor Solutions, Exec Fru, Oil and Gas Workers Association, Pecos Country Operating. The easiest way to start your own podcast and TV show? Real News Communications Network. Stand out from your competition. Produce streams of high quality social media content. Become a thought leader in your industry. With RNCN, you get to be the host. We handle everything else. Tour one of our three locations in Dallas, Fort Worth, and the Colony. Call 972-402-6333 or visit launchashow.com to find out more.